Hello, and welcome back to the third episode in this series of virtual tours. This time, things are going to be a little bit different, as rather than just focusing on one destination, we will be covering several around a theme, the evolution of ecclesiastical architecture in France, in five different styles. I've always been fascinated with architecture, and taking my passengers to churches and cathedrals has remained one of the favourite aspects of my tours. No church is the same, and each have a different story to tell. And, of course, each style of architecture not only has a place in history, but also a place in religion, which, for churches, is fairly important. Before we delve into the various churches and styles, first a quick lesson about the parlance of church architecture. During this episode, I will be talking about certain aspects and features of churches and cathedrals. And, so that you know what I am talking about, I have compiled some sketches by the 19th century architects and historians Sir Bannister Fletcher and Eugène Villette le Duc to help you understand the makeup and the vocabulary of churches and cathedrals. The grammar and makeup of churches generally follow a standard pattern, however, practically every bump, bulge, nook, and cranny has its own name, and each decorative device or structural solution can be described. Here we see the standard plan of a cathedral, though, for reference, it's actually the Cathedral of Amiens in northern France. Running along either side and behind the altar are chapels. They are usually each dedicated to a different saint and allow believers to pray in silence or in private. Some of the chapels are not in use, and as such, in this instance, they are known as chevets. Directly in front of the chapels are side aisles. They are separated from the rest of the church by columns, and eventually lead to the ambulatory in the apse, or east, of the church. In some churches, there are two ambulatories, the other being on the second storey. Running from the west entrance, or narthex, of the cathedral to the centre of the church is the nave, sometimes also known as the central aisle, and running north to south is the transept of the church, and this makes up the arms of the cross. The space where the transept meets the nave is called the bay. Directly ahead of the nave is the choir, and in front of the choir is the altar in the apse of the cathedral, where the priest conducts his mass. If we look at a cross-section of the same cathedral, we can take a brief look at the structures inside the building. Here, we can clearly see the aisle and the nave, making their way along the length of the church in parallel. Above the aisles are, in this case, pointed arches, though, as we will see later, this style is primarily attributed to the Gothic style of architecture. Between the chapels and below the pointed arches are stained glass windows. Above, we have a second row of windows, in what is known as the Triforium, and, above that, a third level, called the Clerestory. The ceiling of this particular cathedral is decorated with ribbed vaulting. With this drawing, we can also see some parts of the exterior structure of the cathedral, notably the buttresses, which stabilise and support the weight of the building, and the flying buttresses, which lean against the side of the building, transferring the weight of the cathedral to the buttresses. Sitting on top of a buttress is a decorative item called a pinnacle, which has no other use other than to be pretty. Moving on, here we have the west façade of the cathedral. Working bottom to top, we start off with the sculptures at eye level. These make up part of a biblical story being told, and are known as jam figures. Directly above them is the tympanum, which continues the story or message. The tympanum is made up of three parts. The lintel, order, and the voussure, also known as an archivolt. The decorative portions that house the tympanum are called the trefoils. Flanking either side of the cathedral are the spires. In this case, only one is a bell tower, and this can be observed through the use of louver boards, allowing the sound of the bells to ring out. Between the spires is a rose window, and both above and below are galleries. Stained glass windows adorn the façade, as well as decorative window frames that do not feature stained glass, and these are called blind arches. They occur either due to taxations at the time, or because the glass itself was damaged, and it was easier, and perhaps cheaper, to fill the space with stone, rather than repairing the damaged glass. 
So now that we should know the difference between a clerestory and a tympanum and an apse and an ambulatory, we'll start this week's tour with the chapel of Saint Etienne in the sleepy Occitan village of Minerf. So here we are, deep in the heart of the Londoner countryside, in the tiny village of Minerf. Despite being a warren of winding streets and ancient houses, the chapel seen behind me is, in the sense of a village, actually quite new. There was an older chapel here, built close to the present site, which would have originally been built in the early Christian style, and in particular, the Merovingian style. After all the Frankish tribes were unified under the reign of a single ruler, Clovis I in the 5th century, a greater emphasis was placed on the building of churches and monasteries. Naturally, the architecture of these buildings responded to the needs of a king and served the purpose of a mediator and translator between the secular and the sacred by the principles of the Merovingian church. Christianity was introduced to the Franks by their contact with Gallo-Romanic culture and was later further spread by its monks. Merovingian kings and queens used the newly forming ecclesiastical power structure to their advantage, and monasteries and episcopal seats were shrewdly awarded to nobles who supported the dynasty. This pragmatic use of monasteries ensured close ties between society elites and monastic properties. Numerous Merovingians who served as bishops and abbots, or who generously funded abbeys and monasteries, were rewarded with sainthood. The outstanding handful of Frankish saints, who were not of the Merovingian kingship, nor the family alliances that provided Merovingian counts and dukes, were almost all descended from the Gallo-Roman aristocracy, especially in the region south and west of Merovingian control. Contrary to the Roman or the modern sense, the literature of Merovingian saints did not set out to reconstruct a biography, but to attract and hold popular devotion by the common people, and the Frankish church helped to define the nature of sanctity and retain some control over the many cults that were developing as a result of the spread of Christianity. During this period of church development, construction was based on, and extending upon, the Roman Basilica plan, and was also influenced by other types of architectural innovations, some of them originating in the East, such as in Syria and Armenia. Whereas in the East, most structures were built from timber, stone had been more common for significant buildings in Western Europe, and so was the preferred building material for the new churches in this time. The old church of Minerf was named after the 4th century Roman Catholic saint and martyr Saint Nazaire. By some stroke of luck, after the original church at Minerf was destroyed and the chapel we can see today built in a similar early Christian style in the 11th century, the original altar survived and was relocated to its present location inside the newer building. It is characterised by the classic definitions of the early Christian style, thick walls, small windows and barrel vaulted, stilted and Roman arches, as well as a lack of any sculpture, ornamental or decorative features. Let us go inside and explore further. Inside, due to the small windows, the chapel appears dark. The altar, however, is the only part of the original Merovingian church that still exists and is said to be one of the oldest altars still in use in Western Europe. Made of white marble, inscriptions on its face denote that the altar was consecrated by the 5th century Archbishop of Narbonne, Rusticus, 30 years after he rose to his position of power. Although through this we can date it back as far as 456 AD, faint marks on its top show Visigoth inscriptions, meaning it is probably a lot older and had been recycled by the Merovingian church. The numerous pilgrims who travelled to Santiago de Compostela in northwestern Spain and the rise in monasticism throughout Europe were powerful influences in 12th century art and were somewhat responsible for the construction boom that occurred during the 11th and 12th centuries. 
Churches began to increase in size and complexity and showed an extraordinary diversity in styles, as demonstrated by the Basilica of St. Mary Magdalene here in the hilltop village of Visley in northern Burgundy. Pilgrimage churches, such as the one behind me, were built to house the relics of saints, many of which were brought to Europe from the Holy Land by Crusaders. Thriving towns sprang up around the churches, and the taxation of local merchants combined with the offerings of pilgrims helped to pay for the construction of these enormous buildings. Let us get a closer look at the facade. The Basilica of St. Mary Magdalene is truly a masterpiece of Romanesque architecture. It was built between the early 11th and early 12th centuries and served not only as the start of one of the few routes to Santiago in France, but also as the centre from which both the Second and the Third Crusades were preached from by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. In cathedrals constructed during the Romanesque period, the tympanum became a site for monumental sculpture with images used as a means of conveying biblical stories, usually the Last Judgment, showing Christ the Saviour enthroned and surrounded by the saved and damned souls to the largely illiterate congregation of worshippers, pilgrims and, in this case, crusaders. As we walk through the entrance behind me, however, we will find another in the narthex, and this is what makes the Basilica of Visley so special. Come on, follow me. Over the north and south portals, two small tympana depict the infancy and the resurrection of Christ, but it's the central portal that is of particular interest due to its difference from counterparts in the rest of Europe. The central portal sculpture, completed in 1132, was amongst one of the first large-scale figural sculptures of the late medieval period, but unfortunately was damaged during the French Wars of Religion in the 16th century. Although most of the damage occurred to easily accessible figures, such as those on the jam, many principal figures placed higher on the tympanum were also damaged, making their precise identification difficult. However, it is commonly accepted that this is depicting the Pentecost. In the centre of the order we see Christ, the largest figure. The Lord, he dominates everything, and either side of him are six apostles. You can see that he is in a mandala, a sort of body halo, but he breaks out of it. He is so powerful and so large that even spiritual light itself cannot contain him. He is giving his mission to the apostles to go and spread the word to all peoples of all nations and all creatures. You can see that they are all holding books, the word of God itself, the accounts that they are going to be preaching. If you look very closely, you can see there are rays, miraculous representations of light that are reaching from Christ's fingertips to the apostles themselves. Christ is sitting in an elegant pose. His knees are together, but they're pushed to the right, and it is thought that this is one of the ways in which his divinity is shown. Look at his body. He's very flat, very linear, very attenuated. The patterns and swirls of flowing fabric in his robes are beautifully rendered, and it is almost as though the cloth itself is a sign of his spirituality. There's a wonderfully divine energy that seems to flow through the figures in their gestures, their gazes, and their postures. The tympanum is quite deliberate in representing the people of Earth and, in a sense, the strangeness of the world beyond Christian borders. When the first crusaders returned, they spoke of incredible lands where people had ears so big they could wrap themselves up inside them. These people are depicted here in the lintel, as are the people so small they needed ladders to climb up onto their horses. To their left, along the rest of the lintel, we have the people of the earth, the need to be converted. Above them, in the archivolt, are yet more characters that reflect this idea of conversion. We see on the left the conversion of Jews, as well as those who cannot be converted, who are represented with the heads of dogs, the people who will bark at anything that is new. On the right, we can see a series of miracles which is meant to inspire. There were people who were blind, who can now see, and people who were deaf who can now hear, as though, through conversion, they have been healed of their disabilities. Above the archivolt are a series of islets that depict the passing of time through the changing of seasons, as well as the creatures that the apostles were sent to teach the word of God. As we make our way inside the cathedral itself, we are immediately struck by its immense size. In stark contrast to the chapel at Minerf, Large windows flood the space with light, though not with colour. 
You see, at this point in the Middle Ages, the master builders and architects who constructed these spaces had not yet developed the art of creating stained glass. But still, there was glass. Most buildings would have had something akin to a pig's bladder stretched across the window openings to block out drafts. But this was the house of God, and only the best and the latest in technology would be acceptable. The massive columns running the length of the nave hold up ambulatories to the north and south, while beautiful arches span the width of the ceiling. You can see that they are decorated. This is all which is left of what would once have been. As we've already discussed, the early Christian phase of building drew influences from the east, and in particular, the Church of Santa Sofia, the first Christian church built in the Roman Empire under the Emperor Constantine I in what is today Istanbul and the checkered patterns which adorn the arches are reminiscent of these Muslim decorations. The measurements of the cathedral were carefully chosen to create a spectacular effect in the nave twice a year. At midday, on the summer solstice, nine pools of sunlight fall upon the centre of the nave, forming a path of light leading to the altar. At the same time, on the winter solstice, the pools light up the capitals on the northern aisle. The Gothic choir was rebuilt between 1170 and 1210 in the Gothic style following a fire which destroyed the original Romanesque apse in 1165 and is an important example of the early adoption of the newfangled Gothic style in Burgundy. But the Gothic style didn't just appear like it appears to do so here at Visley. To understand its development, we must travel to another basilica, that of the Sacred Heart of Barre le Muniel in southern Burgundy. You join me here, standing outside the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. Built in the 12th century by one of the most important abbots of Cluny, the cathedral was designed around its mother house and is, in many ways, a very close copy, and today is considered one of the best conserved examples of Clunaic architecture in France. Although it doesn't look like very much from the outside, it has the feeling of being a fortification, with its bold, dark facade and imposing bell towers, we have to enter to really understand why this is such an important piece of architecture. Inside, the Romanesque arches rise up around us, forming galleries and triforiums above our heads. The nave and the aisles are covered with barrel vaults which internally use different heights which is typical for Romanesque architecture. But it's the pre-Gothic pillars and arches that interest us the most. In the 12th and 13th centuries, feats of engineering permitted increasingly tall buildings. Through the use of buttresses and flying buttresses, the weight of the building was spread equally and then earthed, allowing the architects and builders to construct even taller cathedrals, as though reaching to the heavens, reaching for God. Features that were commonly found in churches and cathedrals over time were altered, giving them strength, delicacy and beauty. Here, it is clear that we are at the very beginning of the Gothic style. The majority of the cathedral had been built in the Romanesque, but the builders were on the cusp of grasping Gothic principles of construction, and so the central arches are ever so slightly pointed, trying their hardest to reach higher. Now that we have seen the transition, perhaps now it's time to see just what Gothic architecture evolved into, and to do that we must travel east to the city of Strasbourg. Behind me is probably one of the most recognisable sites in Alsace, the mighty Cathedral of Our Lady of Strasbourg, rising up in the heart of the city. Although there are still parts of the cathedral, which are in the earlier Romanesque style, it is widely considered to be among the finest examples of high or late Gothic architecture in Europe, so much so that the prolific French playwright Victor Hugo described it as being a gigantic and delicate marvel. Let's get a closer look. Thank you. 
Construction began with the choir and the north arm of the transept in 1176 in the Romanesque style. But then, in 1225, a team of builders coming from the cathedral at Chartres revolutionised the construction by suggesting a Gothic style instead. The parts of the nave that had already been built in the Romanesque style were torn down and the influence of the builders from Chartres was also felt in the Pillars of Angels, a series of sculptures and statues that adorn the cathedral's southern transept and which represent the Last Judgment. Above all, the western façade, decorated with thousands of figures, is a masterpiece of the Gothic era and features the first tympanum to represent the Passion of Christ. The tower was one of the first to rely substantially on craftsmanship, with the final appearance being one of a high degree of lineality captured with stone. While previous facades were certainly drawn prior to construction, Strasbourg has one of the earliest facades whose construction is inconceivable without a prior drawing. Its enormous spire reaches 142 metres into the air and, for nearly 230 years, from its construction in the 1640s until 1874, was the tallest man-made structure in the world. Although that isn't still the case, the cathedral does hold the title of the second tallest cathedral in France after Rouen, and yet, despite this, it is considered a masterpiece of grace and lightness. Before we enter the church, First, we'll take a closer look at the western façade and the central tympanum. The arches of the north portal are decorated with majestic and graceful 14th century statues, representing the virtues and striking down vices, and, around the tympanum, by angels and other biblical characters. The subject of the order of the tympanum is, just as that at the narthex at Visley, the childhood of Christ. While on the south portal, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins is illustrated. Three wise virgins each carry a torch and the open table of law, while beside them is their ideal husband. As for the three foolish virgins, they are holding their torches upside down, clutching a closed copy of the tablet of law, and beside them is a temptress, holding the apple of temptation. From a logical standpoint, the order of a tympanum depicts the last judgment. Above the tympana is the magnificent rose window by Erwin von Steinbach and constitutes the focal point of the façade, a masterpiece of tracery and glass and is unique in the art world. Above the rose window is the gallery of apostles. This is the point of honour of a rich statuary that characterises the façade. During the revolution, all the statues were ordered to be destroyed and more than 230 were. However, this number could have been much higher if an administrator of public property had not managed to hide 67 of them. In the niches of the first and second floor galleries, you can see equestrian statues of 20 monarchs from Clovis I until Louis XIV. Not surprisingly, these statues were the first to suffer the torments of the revolution, yet, luckily for us, they were restored in the 19th century. Below the enormous rose window, we can see the central tympanum. This is the facade's most richly decorated portal. The statues of the prophets of the Old Testament are represented here in the five archivolts of the portal and are supposed to be the link between ancient and modern times and, as such, are guarantors of the accurate unfolding of history. In the four registers within the order, scenes from the New Testament depict the Passion of Christ as the central theme. The jam statue of a virgin with child personifies universal wisdom, the axis around which everything is ordered. Another statue of a virgin is located above the tympanum, which itself is surmounted by a statue of Christ, king and judge, whose throne is surrounded by musical lions. We will be reading the order from bottom to top and from left to right, but don't worry, I've highlighted the portions I will be describing. The first scene, on the bottom register of the order, depicts Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and includes details that are often omitted from smaller examples. On the left, three faces represent the twelve apostles, and above them, a man in a tree cuts palm branches to strew in Jesus' path. Bowing before Jesus, another man spreads out a cloak for the donkey to walk on. On the right, two figures represent the crowd that stood at the gates of Jerusalem. The gate itself acts as a divider between this scene and the next, the Last Supper. Jesus and eleven apostles sit on one side of a table, while the boy with the fish reaches up from the other side. Peter's sword acts as the divider here, and the man whose ear he cut off can be seen crouching below him, 
with Jesus reaching down to heal him. Next, Jesus is seen arrested when Judas kisses him. The last two scenes are divided from each other by the exceptionally tall Jewish cap on the chief priest. To the left, Jesus is slapped for the way he's addressed the priest. To the right, he is scourged by Pilate's men. Moving up on the far left of the second register, one of Pontius Pilate's men puts the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. The chief priest is the next figure, then Pilate with his back turned to the viewer, and then the carrying of the cross, with Jesus assisted by a woman and a man in a cap. The man is probably Simon of Cyrene, whereas the woman is difficult to identify. Behind her is a fruit tree, a reminder of the typological correspondence between the cross and the tree whose fruit was eaten by Adam and Eve. The tree also serves as a divider between this scene and the next one, the crucifixion. The cross is flanked by two pairs of figures. The outer pair comprises Mary on the left and John on the right, with his hand on his cheek, as in many crucifixion images of this period and later. The inner pair comprises Ecclesia and Synagogue, the church and the synagogue. On the left, Ecclesia wears a crown, and her right hand carries some sort of cross or military standard. Her left holds a chalice to collect the blood flowing abundantly from Christ's side. By contrast, Synagogue's right hand holds a broken scepter, and her left a book of the law which is closed. She wears not a crown, but a blindfold. Below the cross is a full skeleton in a sort of coffin, reflecting both the name of the hill, Goldolfa, place of the skull, and the belief that Adam's body lay buried in that very hill. Another tree marks off the final scene in this register, the removal of Jesus from the cross and his burial in a tomb attended by two sleeping guards. Two women watch while a man arranges the body in the tomb, his hand guided by an angel. On the far left of the third register, Judas is hanging from a tree, with a male goat climbing behind him. Exegetes explaining the various scriptural passages involving goats often interpret them negatively, usually as examples of lustfulness and sin, which may explain the large sexual organs on this goat. The rest of the left side pictures the harrowing of hell. With a long cross as the symbol of his authority, Jesus leads Adam, Eve and another soul out of captivity. One woman remains behind in a pit of what seems to be fire. On the right side are two episodes from John's resurrection narrative. Each involve the touching of Jesus' body. In the scene on the left, Jesus tells Mary, do not touch me. And on the right, doubting Thomas touches the wound in Jesus' side and recognizes him as my Lord and my God. The fourth register, which was restored in the 19th century, completes the temporal sequence with Christ's ascension into heaven. There is no mandala, and Mary stands directly above her position in the crucifixion scene, rather than directly below Christ. Christ lifts his hands towards heaven. Inside the cathedral, we can see the effect the Gothic style has had on the space. The ceilings are incredibly tall, and a wealth of colour floods the aisles and the nave through the stained glass windows. The majority are from the 14th century, though there are a few from the late 12th and early 13th. By the 14th century, the development of leading and colouring glass had evolved to a point that intricate designs could be realised, thus allowing the church to tell stories through the windows themselves, just as they had with sculptural art for hundreds of years. These vast, gothic spaces changed the whole way churches and cathedrals were designed. Although imperfections in the glass itself were still common, the colouring became not only acceptable, but desirable too. Colours, apart from the intermediate green of natural glass, were now being developed by adding natural substances to the basic mixture. Cobalt for blue, manganese for purple, copper for red, and so on. Whereas in previous centuries, glass was unstable and delicate, and had to be cut into small diamond patterns before it could be set in the window frames, now glazers were beginning to cut large sheets of pre-coloured glass and leading the bits together to create intricate designs. Almost at once, the idea occurred of making designs, not merely geometrical, but pictorial, was conceived and the art of stained glass was born. The master glazers who created these wonderful pieces of craftsmanship put something into their work that was not simply talent and knowledge, neither was it religious zeal. No, 
They put pride into their creations, and perhaps they found ample justification for it in a religious context. For the Bible said that God was a craftsman who looked onto his work and found that it was good. As we make our way through the cathedral and along the nave, one of the first prominent features we will see is the wonderfully decorated organ. The ornate golden casing was built in 1489, and the keyboard, designed and built by Andre Silberman, has three keyboards, ranging 39 octaves and 2,200 pipes. Behind us, on the western end of the nave, we can clearly see the rose window. Unlike the Gothic tradition of featuring saints, it instead shows ears of wheat, symbolising the commercial power of Strasbourg in the Middle Ages. The north side of the nave is lit by a unique set of five windows depicting 19 emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, dating mostly from the 12th and 13th centuries, though some have subsequently been heavily restored. Further along, we see the magnificent 15th century pulpit, followed by life-size statues of Jesus at the Mount of Olives, that was built in 1498. In the southern arm of the transept stands an incredible astronomical clock, the only one of its kind in the world. Built in the mid-19th century, it is unusually accurate and indicates leap years, equinoxes and more astronomical data and was therefore much more a complex calculating machine than a clock and was even able to determine the date of Easter in the Christian calendar at a time when computers did not yet exist. Today, one can only see the sculpted figurines of this clock, but behind this ensemble there is a mechanism that engages and that represents one of the most beautiful curiosities of the cathedral. The animated characters launch into movement at different hours of the day. One angel sounds the bell while a second turns over an hourglass. Different characters, representing the ages of life, from a child to an old man, parade in front of death. On the last level are the apostles passing in front of Christ. The clock shows much more than the official time. It also indicates solar time, the day of the week, the month, the year, the sign of the zodiac, the phase of the moon, and the position of several planets. From the Gothic came the Renaissance, and after it started spreading from Italy, it left a mark on almost every corner of Western Europe. In France, it became a prevalent type of architecture, used mostly for designing chateaux and was typically affiliated with the royals. Quite soon, after its initiation in the late 15th century, it transformed into French mannerism. This style of French architecture was better known under the reign of Henry II, who worked with Italian architects and artists to help him design the Palace of Fontainebleau. Renaissance and Baroque architecture, as with art, came from Italy, but was slowly Frenchified. The earliest indications of the Renaissance in France actually occurred in funeral monuments, pulpits, portals and fittings of existing Gothic churches, such as that of the tomb of Louis XII. Its rules stressed proportion and order, and so architects and builders sought to improve upon classical designs, shifting away from the Gothic movement and leaning more towards mathematical precision to create unified, balanced structures. That said, these churches are still impressively tall and large, but the load-bearing aspects and structural elements of the building have been hidden from view, allowing the focus of the building to be purely decorative. Seen behind me here, the Trinity Chapel in the Palace of Fontainebleau remains one of the crowning jewels of French Renaissance church architecture. Built for the presence of kings and used by queens and emperors alike, it was built over the site of an earlier church and has seen much reconstruction and redecoration over the years. During the French Renaissance, the decoration of the Palace of Fontainebleau engaged some of the finest artists and craftsmen from Italy and France, producing a style of painting and decoration that became known as the School of Fontainebleau and covered a period from about 1530 until 1610. The work of these artists and sculptors helped form what is today known as French Mannerism. The works produced by the School of Fontainebleau are characterised by the extensive use of stucco and frescoes, and an elaborate and often mysterious system of allegories and myth mythological iconography. Renaissance decorative motifs such as grotesques, strapwork and putty are common, as well as to a certain degree of eroticism. 
The figures are elegant and show the influence of techniques of the Italian mannerism of Michelangelo and Raphael. Here in the nave of the chapel we are surrounded by frescoes depicting the redemption of man from the appearance of God to Noah at the launching of the ark to the Annunciation. They are surrounded these with smaller paintings depicting the ancestors of the Virgin Mary, the kings of Judah, the patriarchs announcing the coming of Christ and the virtues. Between 1613 and 1619, paintings in stucco frames were added between the windows and the sides of the chapel depicting the life of Christ. From 1628, the side chapels were decorated with iron gates and wood panelling, and the Florentine sculptor Francesco Bordoni began work on the marble altar. The figure to the left depicts Charlemagne with the features of Henry II, while the figure on the right depicts Louis IX or Saint Louis with the features of Louis XIII, his patron. Bordoni also designed the multicoloured marble pavement before the altar and on the walls of the nave. The painting of the Holy Trinity over the altar by Jean Dubois the Elder was also added in 1642. Under Napoleon, the old tabernacle of the chapel, which had been removed during the revolution, was replaced by a new one. So where do we go after the Renaissance? It's a good question, and like the Renaissance, modern builders and architects have looked back on the great architectural styles of the past. Master builders had achieved perfection and the peak of engineering capability with the Gothic style, and so, from the late 18th to the late 19th century, French architects built churches in what has since been coined the Revival Period. Neo-Byzantine, Romanesque and Gothic buildings approved upon designs synonymous with the Middle Ages and the spread of Christianity in Western Europe. And perhaps one of the most interesting examples of this style of architecture can be found in the riverside town of Briard on the eastern edge of the Loire Valley. The town had, for centuries, been a centre of enamel production and glassware, and by the early 19th century, a Parisian business magnet, Jean-Philippe Babette Rose, had acquired many of the factories, creating exquisite buttons and mosaic tiles, which were being exhibited in world fairs and sold in the furthest corners of the globe. The town's small church was starting to look and feel its age, and with the ever-increasing number of factory workers coming to Bria, a new church was needed to accommodate the growing congregation. The church we have today was built between 1890 and 1895, and construction was overseen by Babette Rose himself. He wanted the church to be built by the people of Bria for the people of Bria, and so he organised and paid for night classes in which his employees could learn the art of masonry, carpentry, roofing and blacksmithery. The employees were also put their knowledge and skills of producing elegant stained glass and enamel tiles into the new church, and what they accomplished can be seen behind me. The church of St Stephen is built in the Neo-Byzantine style on the outside and the Neo-Romanesque style inside. Rather than using sculptural art to represent the saint, the facade is adorned with thousands of tiny mosaic tiles rendering St Stephen himself, as well as floral and geometric motifs. Stephen is seen in the uppermost gable of a western facade. An early Christian preacher, he was stoned to death by Romans after being accused of blasphemy in the first century AD and is venerated throughout Christendom as the first Christian martyr. He is seen holding in one hand a palm, the sign of a martyr and symbol of eternal glory, while in the other he has three stones as a symbol of his martyrdom. Above the central portal is a frieze with the Greek letters Alpha on the left and Omega on the right, symbolising the beginning and the end. As we enter the church, our eyes are drawn not to the heights of the ceilings and the arches, which are reminiscent of the Romanesque and early Christian churches we have seen, but to the floor, which is laid out with thousands upon thousands of tiny mosaic tiles. It is a testament to the intricate skills of the employees of the Imo de Bria, and symbolism runs throughout the church of St. Stephen. First, at our feet, is written in Latin, bonus intra, melior exi, enter good, leave better. Beside the inscription are the four elements, fire, water, earth and air. A river begins to flow from the narthex, through the nave and until it reaches the altar. Flowing with the river are the senses, touch, taste, smell, etc. 
Then there were four medallions, representing the ages of life. Childhood, with flowers and bud, games, and the crescent of the moon. Youth, the flower is opening, but there are still buds. It is the age of studies, and the crescent moon is increasing. With maturity, it is the sign of reproduction, with fruit on the tree. And finally, we have old age. There are no more leaves, and only a few grains of sand are left in an hourglass. The sign of Saturn symbolizes the soul vanishing, life extinguishing. After each medallion, there is a new detail, blue-colored squares or circles. The river is getting bigger. In the bay, a final description marks knowledge, and then a puzzle is located, implying that life is not as easy as one might think, and that you will need to figure out its mysteries for yourself if you seek the answers from God. The puzzle, which is made up of different squares, circles, and crosses, is situated just below the dome to link the earth to the sky and invites us to ascend towards God. The altar is also richly decorated with gold tiles, and in either wing of the transept, chapels dedicated to the Virgin and Child are adorned with glass from Bria and Murano in Venice. Beside the altar, a statue of Saint Stephen can also be seen, shielding his face with his arm. Above our heads, the capitals of the pillars, which are reminiscent of early Romanesque basilicas, feature iconography which is important to the town, the River Loire, wine and agriculture. The stained glass windows are designed in the Art Nouveau style and, though they seem identical, each one is quite different. At the beginning, the designs are square, but as you advance along the nave towards the altar, they become round. The square is the symbol of the earth, the four elements, the four points of the compass, the material things of this earth. The circle is the symbol of divinity, spirituality, and represents infinity, without beginning and without end. Finally, the rose window in the western end of the church symbolizes the passing of time. Christ is shown in the center with the dove, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, and the sun, stars, water, birds, and trees, which represent creation. Around Christ, time is suggested by the signs of the zodiac and numerous flowers.